Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes from Clark College here with a lecture for our Cisco CCNA 3 class. We're going to be taking a look at Chapter 6, Multi-Area OSPF. This is a follow-up on Chapter 5 where we introduced a single-area OSPF. With single-area OSPF, it was useful in smaller networks. However, if an area becomes too big, the following issues can occur. We could have large routing tables, which means no summarization by default, and those tables will ultimately affect the performance of the network. A smaller table routes faster. We also would end up with a large link state database, uh, taking more CPU and RAM to maintain and you'd have frequent SPF algorithm calculations. Again, the SPF algorithm is the CPU-intensive part of that database. So lots of CPU and RAM utilization would spike on your routers, and you would have a little bit of a reduced performance in your network. And it doesn't mention it here, but really the, the real-world reason why we do areas is to mitigate failures. So if you had a link failure, let's just say a, what we call a flapping link. So if you had a, one of these links going up and down, up and down, and this is typical of like a T1 serial link, if it, um, if it has a problem, it often flaps. And so that flapping link would cause LSA updates to be sent to the neighbor router saying the link is available. Oh, sorry, now it's not available. Oh, now it's available. And those would be propagated throughout the area causing um, destabilization in the convergence of the routers in terms of the routers in the area aren't really sure if that link is up or down at any given moment. And that's understandable, and we can't actually fix that. But, but you have to just get in there and fix that bad link, right? But if you keep your area small, it mitigates or minimizes the impact on your overall network because Outside this area, the other adjoining areas are unaware of this issue because what will happen at area boundaries is summarization, meaning that we're going to summarize, yeah, we have a group of subnets over here and this is how we reach them. We're not going to give detailed information on each one to the adjoining area. So outside of the area, they're unaware of this flapping up and down, up and down. And so they don't have to constantly be updating their, their tables and, and making adjustments. That's the to me, the big reason why we do multi-area OSPF. To do multi-area OSPF, you can't just slap it on there. So you have to apply it to a hierarchically designed network. So that's a VLSM design network, a network with really good thoughtful subnetting applied where you have Maybe all your 172 networks over in Area 1 and then Area 51, maybe those are your 192 networks and that kind of thing where you have really kind of thoughtfully thought out how your network is uh, designed in a hierarchical way. You always have an Area 0 and you learned that last chapter. Area 0 is the area you used for single area OSPF and what we're going to do now is add adjoining areas. Each adjoining area will always connect into the backbone area. So you couldn't connect area one to area 51, for instance, that's not allowed. They'd have to be connected through area zero. So each area, it's kind of a two level hierarchy with area zero connecting all the other areas. So you can create as many areas as you want, but each area will have an ABR and area border router connecting back into area zero. So this is kind of that two uh, two level hierarchy. You have a backbone area and its primary function is to move packets back and forth between the other areas, right? It can interconnects all the other areas and we call it OSPF area zero or the backbone area. Then we have regular non-backbone areas and these are just other areas that you make up and the uh, guidelines for designing these is to keep them small. Take a small number of routers, two, three, five routers and you know, try, try to keep these areas as small as reasonably uh, possible. Remember that areas need to match up with uh, a subnet or a group of subnets. So an area might be a uh, physical location within your company, like you might have you know, San Francisco is an area and Seattle is an area and New York is an area, that kind of thing. 
So those regular non-backbone areas connect users and resources. It should be said, of course, you can have users and resources connected into the backbone area as well. Uh, in fact, you did that last chapter, right? When you were only doing single area OSPF. But in general, um, your users and resources are connected into the um, regular areas and the backbone area is generally pretty devoid of end users but that's not necessarily a requirement. Okay, uh, all routing protocols have an inability to find the internet on their own. So here's router one is connected to the internet. You'd have to go into router one and add a static default route, a quad zero route saying, hey, the internet's this way. And then you'd wanna propagate that route information out to the OSPF routers by using the redistribute default command that we study in the lab. And you'll have a chance to do that this week and you did last week as well. So remember, whenever you use any dynamic routing protocol, be it RIP or EIGRP, OSPF, is, is, they are, are very good at finding and discovering new, uh, new links and new destinations within your company, but they can't find the exit door. They can't find the way out. So you do have to implicitly tell the OSPF routers how to get out of the OSPF network. And so that's really what router one's job is with the static route. And then of course it makes it pretty easy. We just redistribute that static route and then all of our OSPF routers know that the internet is available through router one. And that gives router one an extra title within OSPF. They call a router connected to non-OSPF networks an ASBR, an autonomous system border router. So router one is not only an ABR, an area border router, because it connects area one to area zero means it's an ABR, but it additionally is serving as an ASBR, connecting the OSPF network to non-OSPF networks. A backbone router is any router that has a inter an interface in area zero. So these are all backbone routers. Router one and router two are not only backbone routers, but they're area border routers. And router one is additionally an autonomous system boundary router. Let's talk about different LSA types. You know that the LSAs are the little messages, the event triggered updates that are sent between routers to update them about changes in topology. So you can see the LSA message and the header of the LSA is going to have a type field where a number is put, which indicates what type of LSA message is being sent. In this course, we only look at LSA types one through five. So a type one LSA, as you can see, is used within an area, not inter area, but intra, inside an area. So area one would send type one LSAs to other area one routers. And the ABR doesn't propagate them beyond the area. So the area border routers, and there could be more than one, however many area border routers you may have for area one, will not propagate LSA um, one messages beyond the area. The same goes for area zero and the same goes for area two. So they all propagate type one messages, which are uh, very specific um, information about the available networks within that area. Type two messages are the messages that uh, ABRs generate and ABRs generate these messages to summarize the LSA type one messages that they've received. So they uh, essentially create a summarized uh, list of the changes within their area and then send that out. So that's a lot more efficient, right? So that's being sent to the adjoining areas. So you can see here area two, uh, ABR two has summarized the uh, changes and the um, topology in area two and then sent that summary out to area zero um, ABRs. And those area zero ABRs are forwarding that on to the area one ABRs. And that, uh, that is a way to um, abbreviate and really boil down information. And the idea is it gets more summarized the further you get from the area. 
So area zero would have more specific information about area two than area one would because area one is further away. Okay. Then we have our type three LSAs. Type 4 LSA. Right. We talked about the ASBR and the static route and the redistribute um, default command that you'll add to OSPF. And that'll be redistributed as a Type 4 LSA. OSPF routing table entries. They're easy to identify. They all start with an O, right? And there's several types of uh, route table entry. You have internal routes and you have external routes. Okay, so you can see here that we've got several routes. We have um, summary LSAs with the IA, right? So the IA means it's inter area. So that means that's not specific information about a specific subnet, it's been summarized. There's probably perhaps more than one network within that grouping. So that's a summarized destination. So that means that this router is some distance away from those destinations where the, the O, just the O on its own is depicting destinations that are within its area. Right, so destinations here with an O are gonna be destinations within the area that this router belongs to. And then OIAs are destinations that are in a different area beyond where this router is. And then if we had them, o, oh, there's one at the top, and OE1 or OE2 are external routes, uh, like the Quad Zero route, right? Remember the ASBR connected to the internet would be an example of a route to a non-OSPF network, the internet. And so that's going to get propagated through that redistribute default command as an E2 route. And you can see those again here. Okay, so how are these routes calculated? Right, so um, the router, uses the SPF algorithm to calculate best paths to these destinations. And you can see those resulting calculations are what show up in your routing table. Let's talk about configuring multi-area OSPF. Okay, well, there's really four steps to the configuration. We have to gather network requirements and parameters. So we need to know all the subnets. We need to have kind of a topology diagram of our network. Remember, we have to apply this to a very structured, hierarchically designed network. You don't just apply OSPF to a kind of a collage of devices. It is a highly structured protocol that um, operates best when applied to a highly structured network. So if you have a well-designed uh, network and you have your documentation, that's the first thing you get out. And then you want to define the OSPF parameters, like uh, figuring out what the areas are going to be. And I do that generally by looking at the topology and trying to find some natural breaks where, like I say, physical locations uh, would be one example of where you might define your area boundaries. And uh, you might even have multiple areas within a site location if you had uh, a lot of routers at that site. You might break those up into some areas. And then finally, you configure it all. You jump in your routers and you configure OSPF, assign the links to networks. So you take each interface on each router and make sure each interface is assigned to one of the areas you've created. And then you want to verify its operation with a variety of show commands, uh, certainly show IP route, looking at the routing table and seeing that from any uh, router perspective. And what I like to have done is picked a router, looked at the topology and kind of written down all the destinations or many of them that I would expect to see in my routing table and then looking for those, kind of like a scavenger hunt to ensure they're there. And that pretty much verifies that OSPF is correctly implemented. So for example, if we were configuring it here on router one, 
we would start by doing router OSPF 1 or 10 or 5. But remember, that number is a process ID and it's locally significant only. So you can use any number you want. And then we need to assign a router 1, a router ID. And this router ID is used for various elections, uh, like electing a DR and a BDR. Um, on you know multi-access links within the area and then we are going to assign the networks in this case we're assigning the two ethernet networks to area one and we're assigning the serial link to area zero as you can see here and that's pretty much it with ipv6 it's going to look a little different because instead of putting the network statements under the router ospf process like we've done here with ipv6 you apply the networks right on the interface so i go right into the serial 000 interface or right into the g0001 interface and you can see that here so see how the configuration is just slightly different. I actually prefer the IPv6 one because you're not having to retype all those IP addresses. And that's really nice since IPv6 can be a little bit of a longer address to type. Notice here, all, all we're doing is going into the interface and assigning it the area. I mean, it already knows the IP because it would be on the interface through an IP address command. So here we're just saying this is, you know, gig 00, it's IPv6 OSPF. Uh, 10 and in this case that number does have to match with the process ID that you've used above So if you use 10 to start the router OSPF process, you have to use 10 on each of your interface configurations So again, it's locally significant meaning it has to match within the device Okay, let's talk about propagating a summary route so there's auto summarization in OSPF where routes can be auto summarized. You can also manually summarize routes and you can um, go in and, and enter manual route summaries that are, are used to summarize the routes within an area. And those are usually more accurate if we manually do it. So this is just showing different versions of route summarization. You'll have a number of labs where you summarize routes. Like we said, that's really what areas do for you. When you set up areas, it creates a boundary where the route information is summarized before it's sent on, meaning that the size of the table shrinks for other areas, right? So all those table entries that you need to know if you're a member of area one, you don't need to know all that specificity if you are in area two. So the area one border router is gonna summarize those down and send that out as a summary LSA. So this is really the nuts and bolts, and we've done some of this before. You did some route summarization in your Intech 103 class, and this is this is nothing new to you. We have um, matched up IP addresses here at the step one. We list our different networks that we have within our area, and then we just look at them from left to right. So if you go from the left to right, continue left to right, comparing them vertically column by column until you no longer can match all the bits. So notice in the example provided, we can match the first 22 bits from left to right. So that's gonna be our summary boundary slash 22. So we'll zero out all the bits to the right of that and that becomes our new network ID. So the summarized network ID is shown in step three below. So step one is list out all your networks. Step two is compare them left to right. And step three is write the new summarized route. And notice the mask has changed, right? So we had uh, probably some slash 24 networks. They don't show them here, but they, they may even have different masks, right? They might've been a 24 and a 25, and they've been turned into a single slash 22. This is an example of manual route summarization. 
You see what we've done is since we did the work to do the summarizing, we're just telling this router, router one, this is your area summarization for the 101 network. And so we're providing it a manual summarization and notice that's what router one is now propagating out to router three. So if you look at router three's table, you can see it has um, a OSPF um, area summarization and it matches what we typed in on router one. Then you just verify it with the show commands and you've got a bunch of show commands that you can use. Again, uh, I like looking at show IP route. In this case, they've added the term OSPF to uh, remove other routes like static routes or EIGRP routes. So in a busy router where you might have more than one routing protocol running, it might be useful to add the term OSPF. But generally in our lab environment, you're only working with one protocol at a time. So you could omit uh, the word OSPF. Also, if your routing table is really large, you might have to use the um, operands at the end where you use include or exclude to be able to shorten the table down. Or sometimes I just cut and paste the table into a text editor and then you have find and search commands that can be used on a large routing table. Okay, here's just a look at verifying the settings. So we see that this router, router one, is connected to two areas and these are the networks participating. And so if that matches my topology and what I documented in, in the first part of doing this, where I said, yeah, router one was supposed to be in, you know, in, in two areas and these are the three interfaces router one was supposed to have and yeah, that matches. So that's kind of how you look at that. You're just kind of comparing and verifying to make sure that no omissions. What you might see is that maybe all these interfaces were put in area one, for instance. Well, that would be a real problem, right? Because this is supposed to be the ABR, the area border router. So if you fat fingered that last entry and you had to sign the serial link to area one as well, you'd end up with area one cut off. It would be unable to communicate with any other areas. You wouldn't be able to ping or all those destinations would disappear from the routing table because it wouldn't have a link. It wouldn't have a router that was linked into area zero, which is critical. So, I mean, that's something to try is just to sign all the interfaces here to area one. And you would quickly see that all, all you would see in the routing table would be OSPF routes from other routers in area one. You would see no destinations external to area one. And again, that, that's verifying the routes. Uh, you have some idea of from the perspective of router one, what remote destination networks you it would expect that router one would learn about and you look for them here. This is just looking at the link state database. This is probably not necessary unless you are actually having a problem. So this would be more of the troubleshooting than uh, verifying. So in this case, you're going into the database to see what specific um, LSAs you've learned about, right? So these are the specific uh, LSAs, how long ago they arrived. You can see the age there and they are assigned a specific sequence number and a checksum. and you can see um, kind of where they came from with the link count. So it's got some information that'll kind of help you track down where you're learning these uh, destination networks from. And those same show commands can be used, of course, for troubleshooting. This is just kind of going through the same stuff, but with IPv6. So the summary here is multi-area OSPF is going to be a better choice for larger networks than single area. And we talked about some of the reasons at the beginning of this presentation. It solves the issues of large routing tables, large LSDB, uh, that's the database, and frequent SPF algorithm calculations, that's the formula, so CPU intensive. So RAM and CPU intensive tasks are alleviated by creating multiple areas. Uh, I added a, my own reason for multi-areas. It's not, not my own. It's actually very common in the industry. I would say it trumps these other reasons because today uh, RAM and CPU are fairly 
available. We generally have enough CPU and RAM resources that we're not so worried about that, but we are worried about flapping interfaces and having constant um, unpredictability in our routing tables. So we like to kind of isolate our network from those type of events. The main area is called the backbone or area zero. We recalculate the database um, within an area and that's kept within the area. So outside the area, they don't get our full database. They get a summarized version of it, right? So they don't have to have that big LSDB. Four different types of OSPF routers. You can have an internal router. That's just a router that belongs to an area. It might belong to area one or area two, but all of its interfaces are in that area. That would be an internal router. You can have a backbone router. That's a router that's connected to area zero. It may only be connected to area zero, meaning all of its interfaces are in area zero, or it may be an ABR where it is connected um, to the backbone as well as one or more other areas. In fact, an ABR can be connected to multiple areas. So uh, one router might connect area two, three, and four back into area zero. And then your ASBR, which we you know is connecting the OSPF network to non-OSPF networks. A router simply uh, becomes an ABR when it has two or more statements in different areas, right? LSAs are the building blocks of OSPF. So um, LSAs are flooded initially, right? Devices send a whole bunch of them back and forth to build the LSDB. Then once that's built, they're only sent as event triggered updates. And you'll want in your notes to have a little table or uh, definitions of what all five types that we look at in this course are for. You know, who would receive a type five message? Why would they receive a type five message? That kind of thing, right? Some are um, intra area, some are inter area, some are related to non OSPF destinations, meaning coming from an ASBR, so forth. SPF tree is used to determine the best path. So that's the SPF algorithm, if you will. So the SPF algorithm is used to determine the best path. So it goes through all of the uh, available routes in the LSDB and identifies the one based on cost metrics that would be the best path to take. Okay, OSPF routes in IPv4 routing table are identified using the following uh, descriptors. This is the basic configuration for multi-area OSPF. As you can see, it's really, configuration-wise, it's just as easy as single area, but uh, conceptually, it is more difficult. You have to do a lot more planning to set up your areas before you go in and configure them. But the configuration, the commands are essentially identical to single area, except that you're assigning some of your links to other areas. And then you can manually configure some summary addressing. Thank you.